Geliebte für das, was Sie tun, auch für Sie persönlich. Und ich darf nun Herrn Professor Timothy Snyder bitten, zu uns zu sprechen, der den langen Weg aus den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika zu uns genommen hat. Herzlichen Dank. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction, especially for the mention of Władysław Bartoszewski. The, the, the name is probably a good place to start because Bartoszewski reminds us of the inherent plurality of European history, reminds us that even the strongest parts of European history uh, are accompanied by other strong parts. So a man who was in Auschwitz could also be a rescuer of Jews. A man who uh, was in a German concentration camp could also be held in Stalinist prison. And a man whose life was shaped by the Second World War could live long enough to shape not only communist Poland, but also the free Poland since 1989. European history is rich, and that richness will be my theme today. Now, of course, every, every good lecture begins with a problem and tries to solve that problem, or at least sketch out what that problem is. The problem with which I would like to begin today is the problem which confronts all of you, this problem of commemoration. In its weak form, um, one could state this problem in this way. The end of the Second World War will be commemorated in three days in Moscow, and most of Europe will not be present. That's the weak way of forming the problem. The strong way is to ask the following question. 10 years from now, uh, when we reach the 80th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, will there be a European Union? <laughs> will, will this problem even arise? Will there be a Europe, right? And will there be soldiers marching on Red Square? What will the regime be in, in Russia? I think these are open questions, and I think their answer depends partly upon how well we can think through European history today. So if I take that as my justification, I hope you won't mind if we spend the next 45 or 50 minutes together trying to think this through. So let me begin with the problem. It is obviously the case that uh, the contribution of Russia and of Russians 70 years ago to ending the Second World War was decisive, uh, or at least extremely important. 80% of the German casualties were on the Eastern Front. Um, for all the significance of the British and the French and the Americans, four-fifths of the German casualties were on the Eastern Front. The huge majority of fatalities and wounded on the Allied side were, on, were in the Red Army. Uh, three million Red Army soldiers were taken prisoner and were effectively killed by deliberate starvation in German camps in the second largest German war crime after the Holocaust, one which is largely forgotten. A million Soviet citizens, most of them Russians, uh, starved or died of disease in the siege of Leningrad. These are crimes which alone exceed the entirety of the suffering in the Second World War in most Western countries, including my own. And these, of course, must be recalled. So the question then arises, given the obvious significance of all of this, given the undeniable need to commemorate the Second World War in Russia, why is this not happening together? Or why is this commemoration not a European one? Now, when you invite a historian to give a lecture, there is always the danger that he or she will talk about history. And I'm afraid that I'm about to do that. Um, what I would like to claim is that what we have here is a moment to reflect upon the ways in which Europe has come to think about its own history, good and bad, and to contrast those with the ways that um, the current Russian government is considering its own history. So I'd like to begin by asking, not literally asking, because then you would answer, but, but I want to begin by asking, what is it about the parade in Red Square which is so un un uncomfortable, right? Um, there, there are some obvious answers. One is that 
uh, the, the myth, the, the simple myth of, um, of, of, of the monopoly of virtue of the Red Army is difficult for East Europeans to accept. Everyone, everyone knows this, I'm not going to dwell on it. The very simple point that the Red Army, while liberating from German rule, also brought Soviet rule. Every East European knows that. Many Europeans, I think, are also made uncomfortable by the idea that national history is the same thing as European history, by the attempt to impose a Russian view, no matter how understandable, on the entirety of Europe, um, and to condemn other views as being somehow necessarily wrong. I want to push beyond this a little bit, though, and suggest that there are a few more reasons why I think Europeans are uncomfortable. I think one of them is the, uh, is the military parade as, as such, as a cultural form. More militaristic societies like military parades, less militaristic societies don't like them. It's interesting that both Russia and China this year will be celebrating, um, commemorating the end of the war with a military parade. I think another more specific reason is that this military parade as I'm sure many of you will know, is also meant to demonstrate the, the fighting force of the Russian army. So a number of new weapons will be, will be pulled out across Red Square. Um, the Russian press has made, a, has, has made quite, uh, quite, quite a, has drawn quite a lot of attention to this. And of course, um, some of these new weapons will be weapons, or some of these weapons are weapons which are familiar, right? So for example, the, the Buk anti-aircraft system, which shot down MH17 over Ukraine, will now be pulled across Red Square. So anyone who is watching the parade will be watching the weapon system which shot down a civilian airliner. Um, going a bit deeper uh, or, or, or continuing on this point, it's uncomfortable, of course, that this military parade takes place during a Russian war against Ukraine. It's uncomfortable that some of the soldiers who will be taking part will be soldiers who have been decorated uh, for their participation in the war in Ukraine. President Putin has decorated three units of the Russian army for combat in Ukraine. It's uncomfortable that some of the journalists will be, some of the Russian journalists who will be covering the parade have, them, have been decorated for their coverage of, of the invasion of, of Crimea. These are all things which I think are, are uncomfortable. But I want to suggest that uh, we, can go, uh, we can go a bit deeper and, and consider the thing which I think is truly most uncomfortable for Europeans, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and that is using the War of 1945 as a justification for the War of 2015. Um, the claim which is made in various ways that the invasion of Ukraine is justified by uh, the Russian or the Soviet victory in, in the Second World War. Now, what, or, or, or to put it a different way, the confusion of a war of defense with a war of aggression, right? The idea that because the Soviet Union defended itself against Nazi Germany and Romania and Hungary and Italy and Slovakia and a corset from Spain, let's not forget that, but because the Red Army defended itself, therefore Russia has the right to invade Ukraine. That's a very confusing idea, and what I want to try to do is to bring to bear um, some, some thoughts from history about what this actually means. So how, how could history be useful in considering, in considering this problem? The, the first point that I would want to make, the first thing that every historian would say about all this is that Russia faces a, a, a kind of normal problem, a post-imperial problem. How do you separate national history from imperial history? How do you separate Russian history from, from Soviet history? Where exactly do you, do you draw the line? What, what, exactly, what exactly do you do? Because to make the obvious point, um, as I'm sure all of you know, the Red Army was not a Russian army. The Red Army was the army of the Soviet Union. The only army which called itself Russian during the Second World War was actually fighting on the German side. The Red Army was a Soviet army. Roughly half of its soldiers were Russian, roughly half of its soldiers were, were not Russian. And so this raises the question of, of how you treat this, um, this, this, this mixed inheritance. Uh, a second point that, that all historians would, would make about this situation is that there's a difference between commemoration and, and history. That's probably the first point I should have made. There's a difference that, that commemoration itself has a history. So you might think that the Soviet Union has always commemorated the 9th of May as Victory Day, but that would be a mistake. They've commemorated it since 1965. It was part of um, the Brezhnevite mythologization of the Second World War. 
Um, it was something which was very popular among the generation of the 1970s, which is now in power in Russia and, and in Belarus. Commemoration itself has a history. And it's worth pointing out that in general, uh, the commemoration of the Second World War coincided uh, with periods of greater oppression in the Soviet Union and in Russia. So Brezhnev commemorated more than Khrushchev, um, Putin commemorates more, more than Gorbachev. So the act, the act of commemoration has its own political history. The third thing, and maybe the most important thing that any historian would, would point out about, about this problem, is that uh, the Soviet Union was on both sides of the war. This is the basic problem with commemorating the end of the war, um, that the Soviet Union was on, was on both sides of it. That the Soviet Union was on the German side when the war began in 1939, and then it was on the Allied side when the war ended in, in 1945. Now, it doesn't take a very smart historian to, to, to point this out, and I, I would like to emphasize that this is not a problem which I'm introducing from outside the Russian discussion. On the contrary, this is a, this is a question which arises from Russian commemoration itself. Last year, which was the 75th anniversary of the Maltov Ribbentrop Pact, that is um, the, the 75th anniversary of the alliance between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, which began the Second World War. Last year, President Putin rehabilitated the Maltov Ribbentrop Pact. That is, last year, President Putin, uh, in, in a speech before Russian history teachers, said that the Maltov Ribbentrop Pact was probably a good idea. So this question of how you commemorate defeating Nazi Germany, while at the same time endorsing being an ally of Nazi Germany, is an internal Russian question. And it's the significance of this question which I'd like to spend a little bit na time now uh, uh, ex explaining. Could someone get me a glass of water? Because it's always awkward if I go back and get it my, myself. Oh, could someone who's a member of the European Parliament get me a glass of water? <laughs> um, so the, the, way I, the way I'd like to proceed is, is to consider um, some of the issues that arise from, from trying to combine the, the molotov ribbentrop Pact with the commemoration of, of the end of the war. So it's, it, 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 it'll be obvious to everyone who's here from the Baltic states or from Poland what it means to rehabilitate the molotov ribbentrop Pact, right? The, to, 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 to rehabilitate the molotov ribbentrop Pact is to rehabilitate the beginning of the Second World War. It's to rehabilitate the invasion of Eastern Poland. It's to rehabilitate the annexation of Estonia, Latvia, and, and Lithuania. It's to rehabilitate the deportation of about half a million citizens of these countries to the Gulag. It's to rehabilitate the Katyn massacre, that is the murder of about 22,000 Polish citizens. It's, it's to do an extraordinary thing to rehabilitate the molotov ribbentrop Pact. Um, and, and what I want to spend most of my talk, my talk doing is to try to explain what the relationship is between real rehabilitating the beginning of the war and rehabilitating the end of the war. Now, let me start with the way the molotov ribbentrop Pact has been discussed historically in the Soviet Union and, and now in Russia. There's a, and there's a crucial period, a very important period, and I warned you, a historian will sometimes talk about history, and that, that period is when the molotov ribbentrop Pact was actually enforced. Between 1939 and 1941, um, the molotov ribbentrop Pact was, of course, public knowledge in the Soviet Union. It was presented as a very good thing. Uh, Soviet propaganda was turned against Britain and France and no longer against Nazi Germany. So there was a very odd period in which the Soviet Union was still anti-fascist, but Nazi Germany was not treated as the main fascist state. Now this is worth remembering because it, it tells us how the fascism, the term fascism, need not actually be, dire be directed at fascists. It's directed against whoever is the target of Soviet foreign policy. So while the Soviets were allies of Nazi Germany, the Nazis themselves were not fascists. Other people were, were fascists. So this is crucial because it teaches us about the flexibility of this term. Between 1945 and 1990, um, the Soviet position was that the molotov ribbentrop Pact had never happened. Um, it, was, it was not only a taboo, it's, it's, its existence was entirely denied. Uh, the documentation of it was revealed around 1990, and since then, of course, everyone knows that, that it took place. The period that interests us 
the most recent period is the period since last year when President Putin rehabilitated the molotov ribbentrop Pact. And it's the juxtaposition of rehabilitating an alliance with Germany with glorifying the defeat of Nazi Germany which, uh, which, which, which concerns us. And what I want to ask is, what is actually going on here? Um, what, is, what does this mean for, for Russian commemoration and for European commemoration? Now, before I begin this discussion, I want to stress two things. The first is that what I want to do with this is, is something positive. I don't just want to criticize Russian commemoration because er you can criticize everyone's commemoration. You can certainly criticize American commemoration. Um, what I want to try to do is use this as an opportunity to consider what some of the more successful attempts at contemporary history have looked like. What I want to do is to try to consider what um, exemplary European commemoration looks like, or to put it more broadly, where in what European institutions or from what European traditions or practices do we actually get good versions of commemoration? Because of course it's easy to criticize and all nations have moments when you can criticize them. So what I want to try to do is, is consider what I think are four sources or, or four dimensions of laudable, of successful European commemoration or, or historical practices. What I want to try to claim is that um, in the last 25 years or so, we see that pragmatic, useful, um, exemplary commemoration or historical discussions come from four sources. They tend to be social, uh, that is arising from civil society. They tend to be international, that is involving more than one European nation. Uh, they tend to be critical, that is reflective upon oneself in a critical fashion, and they tend to be responsible, that is they tend to involve taking responsibility for, for events in the past. So what, what do I mean by this? And if you accept just for the, for the time being that these are good criteria for what a responsible historical discussion looks like, how does the Russian treatment of the Second World War actually correspond to these things? Well, let's begin with civil society. Many of the important European discussions about the Second World War have to do with civil society, whether it's the Historikerstreit in, 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 in Germany, which begins from one philosopher, whether it's the discussion of the Holocaust in Poland, which begins with a book which was published for free by one small non-governmental organization, um, whether it's the discussion of totalitarianism in Russia, which has a great deal to do with a few non-governmental organizations, such as Memorial, non-government organizations, journalists, and historians uh, acting at their own initiative and unpredictably, an unpredictability is crucial, are, are part of, are, of, of reconsidering the past. The Second World War, I think we've learned, is not something which can be, it, it, the reconsideration of it cannot be planned. It tends to come from below. And here I think we see some of the problems with the contemporary Russian discussion. Uh, in, in, in Russia today, rather than non-governmental organizations, although they of course exist and are very important, and I'm going to use many of their arguments in what follows, um, the, the government overwhelms them with government-organized non-governmental organizations. Um, particular non-governmental organizations such as Memorial, which I've already mentioned, are subject to harassment and repression. Um, the government, uh, uses the idea of the falsification of history to suppress discussions which are not contrary, which are contrary to the current line. Um, and the foreign minister and the president take it upon themselves to say what's historically true and what's historically not true. So it, this, uh, what I'm trying to claim is that part of the problem or one of the sources of the problem is, uh, is that the discussion has not been sufficiently social or it hasn't, it hasn't arisen from civil society. A second criterion, I think, of a useful European discussion is, is that it's been, it's been international. Not because someone else's history is correct, right? It's not that French history is right and German history is wrong, or German history is right and French history is wrong, or that Polish history is right and German history is wrong. It's that the confrontation of other, of, with other perspectives can often generate something new. Right? It's very hard to generate something new just inside the confines of one national discussion. Um, so European discussions which have worked have tended to be international. They tend to have involved multiple historians from, from multiple countries. And so here we, have a, here we have an opportunity, I think, to, to, to ask how one would discuss the molotov ribbentrop Pact, right? Or how one would discuss the Second World War in, in Russia. If you're going to discuss the molotov ribbentrop Pact, if you're going to rehabilitate it, for example, it would make sense to have a discussion among 
Jews, because Jews were very much concerned by the molotov ribbentrop Pact. When it was, it was announced during the World Zionist Congress, the president of the World Zionist Congress, when it was announced, said, my only prayer is to meet you again alive, which was perfectly justified since most of the Jews in Europe lived on the territories affected by the molotov ribbentrop Pact, and most of them would be murdered within three years after its signing. So a discussion about the molotov ribbentrop Pact might involve Jews, it would certainly involve Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, not because everything they have to say about the molotov ribbentrop Pact is right or reasonable, because it affected, it affected them. Likewise, um, a, a discussion of the Second World War from 1941 to 1945 uh, has to involve, I think from a Russian point of view, right, for it to be useful and interesting, it should involve the Poles who suffered on a scale which is comparable to the Russians. It has to involve the Belarusians who suffered more th as, an, as, a, as a territorial group, who suffered more than, than anyone else. That is, more people on the territory of Belarus were killed or deported than people on the territory of any other European country. It has to involve Ukraine, which was the main German war goal and which was occupied by Germany for a great part of the war and which it proportionately suffered more than, than Russia did. So a discussion of what 1941 to 1945 means and what victory means has to involve, you know, at a minimum, those, those kinds of groups. Likewise, it, it goes without saying that if one is going to discuss victory, then the, the audience has to be broader. It has to include Hungarians and Czechs and Slovaks and Yugoslavs and, and, and all East Europeans who then experienced communism because the question of what victory means hangs a lot on what, what comes after it. But let me make a further point, and this will be, the, I promise this will be the one, the one truly American thing that I'm going to say. If, if the, the, the question of victory in 1945 is also a question of international history in the broadest sense. Part of the, of, of the limitation of the idea of the Great Fatherland War is that it limits the war to Europe itself, right? And when you limit the war to Europe itself and you imagine the war as the Red Army liberating Eastern and Central Europe, you, you can overlook a couple of important things. One is that there was, an, there was another war going on in the Pacific, which the Americans essentially won by, by themselves. And from the point of view of contemporary Russian thinking about geopolitics, I think this is, a, this is a, an important thing not to forget. <laughs> if you're going to model your international relations on the Second World War, it's probably worthwhile to remember that you, during the war, had an American ally in, in Asia. The second thing which is interesting and which may be worth remembering is that when the, Red Army when the Red Army started beating the Wehrmacht, or when the Red Army returned to Eastern Europe, it was driving American jeeps and automobiles, um, which is a, just a simple and obvious example of the way that American technology helped the Soviet Union to win the Second World War. I cannot be 100% sure, but I have a feeling that on the 9th of May, American technology is not going to be commemorated. But it's, it's, it, when, if one is going to treat the Second World War as a model for contemporary international behavior, American technology is something that's worth remembering, right? Cutting yourself off from American technology um, is, a, is not in the tradition of the Second World War in the Soviet Union. The tradition of the Second World War in the Soviet Union was to exploit American technology. Okay, but that's just the kind of very simple thing you can say when, when you internationalize the discussion. The, the next thing I'd like to claim is that um, a good European discussion of contemporary history is critical. That is to say, the, the point is not, and of course the Germans, the Germans have been exemplary in this, the point is not to say defensively how what happened during the war was right. The point is to ask difficult questions about one's own history. And, and here, I mean, the opportunities in Russian history for critical discussions are, are considerable. And when I say this, I'm not saying that it's only true of the Russians, right? It was correct for America to have a discussion about putting its Japanese Americans in internment camps. It was correct for the United States to have a discussion about the correctness of dropping atomic bombs on, on Japan, a discussion which is, which is ongoing. Um, it's correct for everyone to have a critical attitude about their own history. But in the case of Russia, I think we have some particular opportunities, um, especially with the current president in, who's in power. So for example, the question of whether it made sense to murder half of the higher officers in a great terror in 1937 before a war. Um, the question as to whether in general the great terror of 1937 and 1938, which killed something like 700,000 Russian citizens, roughly half of them on what was going to be the front of the war, 
whether this was actually preparation for war, as Molotov and Kaganovich insisted, as Stalin himself said, or whether perhaps it was not preparation for war, or if it was preparation for war, maybe it wasn't the best possible preparation for war. Um, these are discussions which um, a president who himself was a KGB officer, I would think would have a particular uh, facility in, in beginning, if he, if he so desired, because these are questions of, of intelligence. Likewise, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact itself, which Stalin defended as the best way to hold off Nazi Germany, was that in fact the case? Did it make sense to invite the Wehrmacht closer to Moscow, which is what the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact entailed? Even strategically, was it a good idea? Leaving the morality and the politics aside, strategically did it make sense to bring the, the Wehrmacht all the way um, into, to, to Eastern Poland? One could argue that perhaps it was not such a good idea. One could also ask um, why it was that Stalin ignored more than 100 intelligence warnings to the effect that the Wehrmacht was massing for an attack on the Soviet Union. If the claim is going to be that Stalin was a good manager, right, um, I, one then has to ask if he was such a good manager, why didn't he pay attention to the intelligence information which was, which was arriving to him, which is related to the question of, um, of Soviet losses, which of course were enormous. And one of the reasons Soviet losses were so enormous was that they were confronting the Wehrmacht, which was probably the best army in history, carrying out its major operations. But there are perhaps other reasons why Soviet losses were so great, which had to do with the management of, of the war it, itself. Um, and then, of course, a last question which one would want to ask, I think, from a Russian point of view, is why was there resistance to Soviet rule when, when it returned? So these are just questions that one would ask critically. The final criterion for, I think, for useful, for a pragmatic, for a fruitful European discussion is the criterion of, of responsibility. And, and by responsibility here, I mean in particular responsibility for the Holocaust, which I, I agree with my, my late friend Tony Jutt is a kind of marker of, of, uh, of European um, commemorative discussions. Now, what do I mean by responsibility? I mean that the moment you treat history as national, you have to begin from a sense of responsibility. As a professional historian, I have to say history is not in fact national, that the national framework doesn't work. But the moment you commemorate nationally, the first step has to be to take responsibility for the nation. If you're going to claim that the nation exists and has a history, then the first step has to be to take responsibility for what the nation has done. Um, and, and this is, you know, with respect to the Holocaust, this has been a kind of useful, a kind of useful check. It's led to important discussions about national innocence and guilt in France and in Poland. There are important discussions yet to come in other places like the Baltic states and, and Romania. I have no doubt those discussions uh, should and, and, and will take place. It's also a discussion which has to take place inside Russia with connection, if, with connection to the Soviet Union and, and to Russia itself. Because of course, Soviet citizens took part in the Holocaust massively. The, the, the first half of the Holocaust, the murder of two, of, of two and a half million people by bullets, took place with collaboration of Soviet citizens. One can ethnicize those people. One can say that they were Russians and Belarusians and Ukrainians and ethnic Germans and Tatars and Estonians and so on. One can say that and that would be true. But the one thing they all had in common was that they were Soviet citizens. It was only in the Soviet Union that the Holocaust took place by bullets. And so if one is going to consider the history of the Soviet Union during the Second World War, this is something which has to be brought into the picture. Likewise, um, Russians in general do not behave any differently than anyone else. So there are Russian guards at Treblinka and Sobibor and Belzhets. Um, there are Russian policemen carrying out the Holocaust, not only in Russia, but also in Belarus and in Latvia. Um, there, there are Russian neighbors denun denouncing other Russian neighbors. There are Russians moving into Jewish houses. Not that they were worse than any other Soviet citizens. They behaved exactly like other Soviet citizens. And in fact, they behaved in general the way that all Europeans behaved, which, is that, which means that the discussion in Russia um, perhaps should follow normal European lines. The point I'm trying to make to emphasize is not that Russia is different than anyone else. It is that the moment that you decide that your history is Russian history, it has to begin from uh, Russian responsibility, and that one of the normal European topics would be responsibility for the Holocaust. 
That is all normal. I mean, the, the, that, that the discussion hasn't taken place in Russia, that's not so surprising. It generally takes European countries a long time. If you consider France, which had much better conditions for this kind of discussion, it still took more than 40 years for the discussion truly to take place. Even in Germany, where the conditions were much better, uh, the, the, a serious discussion of the Holocaust waits, in my view, until, until the 1980s. So it's not surprising that it's taken so long. What is unusual in the Russian case, or in the case of contemporary Russia, and what I think is what, 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 what bears a certain amount of attention is that uh, responsibility, rather than being taken, um, responsibility has been exported. And, and this is new. This is something which in general European countries have not done. Um, the Holocaust has been ignored or it's been blamed on Germany, um, but what, what European countries have generally not done is blame other European countries for it. And the, the particular move which has been made in, in Russian propaganda, which is uh, particularly, I think, of concern, is to take all of the responsibility for the Holocaust in the Soviet Union, that is, for those two and a half million or so Jews in the Soviet Union who were, who were killed, and place it on specific ethnic groups who used to be part of the Soviet Union. So the idea that the Holocaust in the Soviet Union is the fault of the Estonians or the Latvians or the Lithuanians, or today the Ukrainians. Now, there's a reason why you can make this claim, because plenty of Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, or Ukrainians were involved in the Holocaust. But the idea that it was an ethnic crime, or that Russians have the right to say that it was the Ukrainians, that is something that is new. Rather than taking responsibility, exporting responsibility to your neighbors is something entirely new, I think, in European commemorative practices. And it's something which is worth paying attention to because of its consequences. The relationship between that kind of behavior and war is, I think, very, very close. I think it's, it's the moment when you export responsibility that you are creating a justification for aggression against your neighbor. Because if it's your neighbor who bears the blame for everything bad which happened in the Second World War, then naturally it would make, it would make sense to attack that neighbor. And it's in this way that we approach the Russian rationale for the war in, in Ukraine. The Russian rationale for the war in Ukraine has to do with the idea that the Ukrainians are somehow to blame for the bad aspects of the Second World War and that Russians naturally bring the good aspects of the Second World War. There is simply no reason to think this. Um, Russians and Ukrainians both had played very mixed roles in, in the Second World War, as any serious, Rus any serious Russian or any serious European uh, Ukrainian history would have to acknowledge. So, if that's, if that's all true, I mean, if it's, if it's fair to say that uh, getting commemoration wrong in the specific sense of exporting responsibility to your neighbor tends to lead to war, what, what would this mean specifically for, for Ukraine, for, for Russia, and, and, finally, and finally for Europe? So it gives us a way of looking at the specific course of events in Ukraine, which we might not have otherwise. If we think of, of the Russian rationale for the intervention in Ukraine, um, the Russian rationale was that the Ukrainian state, in the normal sense, has ceased to exist. So, for example, when the Americans and the British brought up the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, the response of the Russian Federation was that Ukraine no longer exists, therefore our signature on the Budapest, referen Bud Budapest Memorandum of 1994 um, by which, of course, Russia promised not only not to interfere in Ukraine, but, but to protect Ukraine. Ukraine no longer exists, therefore that doesn't, that doesn't hold. Um, that is the same rationale that was used in 1939 when the Soviet Union invaded Poland, almost word for word. The idea was that the Polish state no longer exists in a normal sense, therefore we're not invading a state because there's no longer a state there. Likewise, um, the, uh, the, 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 the ethnic and the linguistic justifications of the Russian intervention in Ukraine are the same kinds of justifications which were used in 1939. When the Red Army crossed the Polish border in 1939, the claim was we are protecting ethnic brethren, we are protecting Russian speakers, we are protecting Ukrainians and Belarusians who have to be protected. So the arguments are exactly, are, 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 are exactly the same and are actually strikingly, strikingly similar. Another way all of this immediately becomes relevant for Ukraine is if you consider, um, you consider the instrumentalization of the Holocaust itself. So the, 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 the odd thing which happened, in, in, in which, let's not remember it, which occupied the minds of many Europeans and Americans for that matter for much of 2014, was the question of 
as, as someone put it to me after the last, le last lecture I gave, are all Ukrainians really fascists, right? Now, that whole way of phrasing the question is an export of responsibility, and that whole way of phrasing the question is a way of, of, of uniting the Second World War with, with, the current world war, with the current war in Ukraine. And that whole way of posing the question is a way of interpreting 1941 to 1945, which is highly national, but which is also highly trivializing. Because one aspect of that claim was the idea that the Ukrainians were Nazis. And that was used in particular to arouse Jewish public opinion uh, against Ukraine. The consequence of that kind of discussion of the Holocaust, in which you simply say, it was my neighbor and not me, it was my neighbor and not me, is to trivialize the Holocaust as such. Using it as a weapon in this kind of way has the consequence, and perhaps the intended consequence, of making the Holocaust um, less significant than, than, it really, than it really should be. The, uh, for, for Russia itself, um, this move of exporting responsibility, I think, may have, may have the greatest consequences, um, because it, it, it calls into question some of the basic terms of, of political discourse. If you're going to define yourself, for example, as working against fascism, right, which many Russian institutions do, and if you're going to use fascist as a term of opprobrium, if that's going to become your political vocabulary, what does it mean to simultaneously um, rehabilitate the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, that is the greatest alliance with the greatest fascist power, in, in the most significant alliance with the greatest fascist power I that, that ever took place? What does it mean to simultaneously do that the concern, of course, um, is that when you do that, you're taking, you're taking the meaning out of your own term, right? That even from the point of view of Russia, the word fascist cease to me ceases to mean anything. Um, and then you, you expose yourself to, to a couple of dangers. I mean, the first is that no one takes you seriously when you talk about fascism, which of course is a problem because the rise of the far right is a big problem in Europe. But the second is that if fascism loses all of its content in the Russian language, it then becomes difficult for Russians to recognize certain things in Russia itself, right? Now, I, I I'm not claiming that Russia is a fascist country, which it's not. What I am claiming is that there are certain aspects of fascist tradition which are slightly more visible in Russia than they are in other places, let's put it like that. So, for example, military parades themselves um, are something which fascists in generally liked quite a lot. Um, the, uh, the cult of a particular leader, right, a particular personal leader, a bit of a fascist thing. The obsession with homosexuality also kind of tends in, 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 in that direction. The ethnic logic of foreign policy, claiming that you defend ethnic brethren. The associated um, the denial of the significance of international law and state borders. All of those things, uh, all of those things push in the direction of the far right. And of course, you need in Russian and in other languages, you need a language to criticize that, right? But if the and if the word fascism loses all of its significance, or if it's a word which only applies to other people, then it's hard to know what the language would be they would use to criticize that. But um, there's there's a there's a sharper version of all this, of course. So what I just put before you is the innocent version, right? That Russians would like to be critical, but they're losing their language for doing so. There's a sharper version of this, which is that the rehabilitation of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and combined with um, the glorification of the victory over Nazi Germany, is intended as a contradiction. That it's meant to be a contradiction. Um, that it's not, or to put it a different way by certain people who advocate something called the conservative revolution in Russia, it's not seen as a contradiction at all because the enemy are the liberals in the middle. The enemies are the Democrats in the middle. Therefore, an alliance between far right and far left makes perfect sense, right? Um, that is one rationale which one sees for simultaneously rehabilitating the beginning of the war and glorifying the end of it. And it has a policy uh, realization, right? It has a policy realization. The policy realization is inside the European Union, where the Russian Federation now supports, as you all know, because this has finally made it into the press, the Russian Federation supports the extreme extreme right by, for example, inviting them to observe um, the electoral farce in Crimea. It supports separatism. It supports the populist far right. It supports all of the far right forces in Europe which are against European integration. This is the contemporary realization of the politics of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. 
the idea of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Pact the first time around, it didn't work, but the idea was you take the European far right, Nazi Germany, and you turn it against Britain and France. You turn it against the European order. That was the idea. The, I the idea this time around is that you take the European far right, that is the extreme right and the populists, and you turn them against the European order to bring down European integration. This is the contemporary politics of, of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. And when I predicted a year ago that Russia would rehabilitate the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, this is what I had in mind, that Russian foreign policy is using the same idea of reaching out to the far right to, to undermine the European Union. Which brings me to the very last point that I want to that I want to make, which is wh what this all might mean for Europe it, itself. Uh, so, for, for for Europe itself, I think what we ha what we see is that Europe is facing um, this Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in in practice, um, and 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 thus far is only beginning to realize what what this might what this might mean. Um, that, the Euro that if, if Europe is a project of integration, it's logically possible that someone could have a, po a policy of disintegration which was aimed at, at the European Union, that that's a logical historical possibility, and in fact, that it is, it is, it is, it is what's being realized. Um, what, what, what concerns me a bit, though, is that, um, or more than a bit, in fact, what concerns me quite a lot is that Europe uh, may not have the historical resources to defend itself ag against this kind of thing. And what do I mean by this kind of thing? What do I mean by this kind of thing is history which is not only not g the good things, it's not social, it's not international, it's not critical, it's not responsible, but it's history which is deliberately chaotic. It's history which is meant to sow discord and, and confusion. Um, the contradiction between supporting the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and celebrating the end of the war is not a contradiction which Russia is going to solve. It's a contradiction which is going to be pushed out to you. If you criticize them for rehabilitating the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, they will, they, will, uh, they, will, they will condemn you for that. If you criticize them for celebrating the end of the war, they will also condemn you for that. They're not going to resolve the contradiction. They're going to leave that contradiction with you. They're going to put it into European discourse and they're going to let you deal with it. And the question for me is how well European resources, historical, intellectual, moral, can, can respond to this. What we have is a kind of contest, I think, between the good European model, and when I say that I don't mean it's always followed by all Europeans, I mean it's occasionally followed by some Europeans, the good European model of history as lessons, right, history from which you draw lessons, as, as Sandra Camieta was discussing, and history as license. History is a kind of resource with which you can do anything you want. And it's, not, it's just not clear to me where that contest is actually going to end. One of the reasons why I'm not sure how it's going to end is that, of course, the Russian approach plays on, exploits, draws from weaknesses in Europe and, of course, in North America itself. Our history, too, is very often narcissistic. Our history, too, is very often national. The way that European history is taught is shockingly national, given the extent to which European integration has proceeded in other forms. And it's precisely this which allows Russian policy to make the inroads that it does to Germany or to Hungary or to France. If there were more European history, that kind of engagement, I think, would be, would be harder than it, than it actually is. It is, it, it is also the case that the concept of memory, which we have privileged in the last quarter century over history, is infinitely flexible. It tends to be relativistic. It tends to, it tends to take the form of, I have a memory and you have a memory. And if your memory turns out to be extraordinarily aggressive towards my memory, I have very little to say about it, right? It's just a memory. It's entirely subjective. If you, if you opt entirely for memory over history, you're depriving yourself of one of the ways to defend yourself against this kind of infinite flexibility. Um, this infinite flexibility which ends up aiding this, this kind of anti-enlightenment. So it seems to me, to bring this to a conclusion, that we are at a kind of breaking point, um, that what appears to be just the commemoration of the war is actually something much, much greater, that the, fa the absence of European leaders from Red Square is not just a momentary reaction to this or that this or that war or this or that Russian behavior. It actually signals a, a, a crisis within the European order itself. Um, because it, it's not, of course, the case that Europeans, when they don't go to Red Square, 
nowhere to go. This is one of the striking things. If you don't go to Red Square, you immediately have to improvise and decide where you're going to go. Am I going to stay at home with my family? Am I going to lay some flowers at the, at the Unknown Soldier? Am I going to go to Gdańsk? There is no European place to go. And that's because there isn't a European history of the Second World War. Now, there are good tendencies. And the ten these are the tendencies I've, I've identified as social, as, as critical, as responsible, as international. And those tendencies, I think, are there and worth developing. And I think in this moment of crisis, it's worth considering precisely what the European model of coming to terms with the past is. Because to end where I've begun, it's not enough to criticize Russia at this particular point. We all have our moments in commemoration which are less than ideal. That includes all European countries, it includes the United States. It's not enough to say that this is inadequate. It's more important to notice how the, this particular inadequacy involves exporting Russian problems into a European discourse and then asking yourself, what are the European frameworks which might actually allow us not only to respond, but to treat this moment as a challenge and therefore as an opportunity to decide what European history is all about and how Europeans ought to be pursuing their own history. Thanks a lot.